Welcome everybody to Beyond the Streets. We here in America started this specific art form. Graffiti is ancient, but what we know of graffiti today is what these original writers created. And it makes me feel so proud to, to pay homage to them. Um, because it's lasted all these years. They all thought it was going to be a passing phase, and it hasn't been. It's been a continued cultural phenomenon. And um, I never did tag my name up there because I was horny and I was afraid to get arrested. Um, but if you have to think about how daring these original graffiti writers were, and how it evolved into street artists, and how the graffiti writers evolved into the galleries, and and develop their art into true fine art, contemporary art. And everyone asks, well, why are you here besides the fact that you're from Blue? Um, check out the small. Um, but uh, it's because my husband, I feel so shit, so like shy to say this, but this is the first time I've been able to speak uh, on behalf of my husband, Eric Hayes, one of the original three. <laughs>
together. Okay. Jose and Mike, Jack Star, SJK. We started back in 68, 1968. And uh, this is where we are today, 51 years later. You, you guys right? Or? Yeah, this is our name. Yeah. Okay. SJK 171. I'm Jack Star, and this is uh, we're in this book right here. Originators of Graffiti in New York, 1968. I feel the same, man. It's all, it's all good. I, you know, it's uh something we did. We didn't have anything else to do, so we did that. And uh, we really appreciate that we're getting honored for this. This is a, you know, a great story. We, uh, we created stylized letters, and we added colors on top of the uh, the uh, subway lines. So from there, we we we, we, uh, we transferred it onto canvas. We were the first to transfer graffiti onto canvas. We were called United Graffiti Artists. Well, initially it was called writing, and that's what it was. Kids were writing their names. So essentially, kids were writing their names and their signatures, but because of competition, it got bigger and bolder. The kids wanted to do that. Kids wanted to outdo one another. So that simple idea of competition in New York City at a time when the city was bankrupt and kids had nothing to do, they were writing their names on train. And to think about where we come from, coming from right to the side of subway cars to exhibitions like this, it's pretty amazing. Born in the Bronx, Joe Conzo photographer, documentarian, and uh, just been part of the culture for, for a minute, a long time. And I'm so glad that we're here, that they're including photographers in this exhibition because the way I like to put it is if it wasn't for photographers like myself, Martha Cooper, you know, the visuals of the culture would be non-existent. So you have to thank the, uh, the photographers. And that always had a, a strong impression. And so 
I wanted to bring that out in my own words. I thought it would be clever to have a sort of Los Angeles contemporary twist on something that's super traditional. I thought it would be really West Coast, so that tattoo on his belly says local and it's in old English letters that you that I'm you know you're synonymous with LA culture uh, a lot of the gang members Chonos um, do tattoos on their bodies uh, signifying uh, their neighborhood so that's because I also grew up in um, Bull Heights I was born and raised in Bull Heights where it's uh, mostly Latino when I was growing up and I uh, saw a lot of that. subway yards and painting and continuing that process through graphic design and painting and now beyond the streets. Last question, second last question. What was it like for the Easter Parade? How did that happen and how 
the current real estate relationship has lasted this long? Well, collaborating with the Beastie Boys has been great. We've been friends for over three decades, and they're just visionary pioneers. I can't state it any more clearly, but they're also great collaborators. They give people like me an opportunity to really blossom and do things on a creative scale that I wouldn't have had the opportunity to do otherwise. Uh, I write Gear Snot, I rap crew, um, and I've been writing since the late 90s, 96, 97, or 95 really actually, but I started writing Gear Snot in 97. It wasn't really easy in the beginning, I got in trouble for doing a documentary, um, the cops came to my job and arrested me for writing graffiti in a documentary, you know, like just on the street. And, um, you know, I did five years probation for that, but I think I, I paid the price. And like now I have the right to sort of own um, my identity outright, which I think, which for me is ideal to not have to hide, you know. documentaries and films and books and traveling around the world and our paintings were selling like hotcakes and we were able to adapt but I was the only female up until the 1990s when there's more women started to come out and paint and now we have a sort of an informal sisterhood but still there's very few of us very few females painting because it is difficult manual labor but women are made stronger and sturdier and braver and just as reckless and as crazy as the boys. I watch American Ninja, I get you. Um, do you see a difference in everything that's done gender-wise? There is a difference when a woman does it and when a man does it. Is there a difference in the artwork when it comes to graffiti? Do, do women offer something different or, or uh, in, in this art form? When we're talking about graffiti in its purest sense, as in vandalism, um, what women offer is perhaps a little bit more thoughtfulness in where you're tagging up in the middle of the night. Nothing more than that. The women are also out there to bomb and destroy, to get up and to be seen. When we're painting legally in the daytime, beautiful murals and communities, I find that the ladies have a little more sensitivity and thoughtfulness for the community and engage in a dialogue with the locals in order to find and fit their needs for their neighborhood. And the guys, not so much. 
when you talk about you know finding the right place in tech, was it ever a concern for you as well in terms of you know, society wanting to crack down on this, law enforcement coming to look for you? Um, my generation of graffiti artists in New York in the early 80s was primarily focused on the subway trains. I did not tag up on buildings, people's houses. None of that was necessary. Street bombing, out of the question. We were focused on the subway trains, getting into the train yards, into the tunnels, and figuring out the schedules for when they're rolling and, and how it's done to do it correctly. And I went to the right places with the right people, and I never had any incidents with the police. Is it, is it, were the trains also especially interesting because if you paint one train, it could be seen in multiple boroughs, multiple neighborhoods? Um, the success for New York graffiti had to do with the rivalries that arose from the subway train going through different boroughs. It was the bloodstream of New York. Um, young kids, teenagers, who was going to come see their artwork. So the artwork would put up and rolled across the city as a moving canvas for the world to see, to uplift the spirits of those um, strap handlers going to work looking so sad and depressed. A little bit of color and fun will do them some good was our imaginations. But um, that's how the feeling was born and the rivalries extended and grew throughout. Kids that didn't even know each other from the Bronx and Brooklyn would battle each other through their artwork. They never met in person, but they would see what those cats did last week and then they're like, oh, we have to do bigger and better and badder and so on. And the rivalries on the subways grew into this massive movement that you see as the world's biggest art movement ever.